Hi, I'm Dr. Rajveer Purohit. I'm the Director of Reconstructive Urology at Mount Sinai. My specialty is uh, gender-affirming surgeries, uh, particularly gender-affirming genital surgeries. So I'll do metoidoplasties, phalloplasties, as well as vaginoplasties. And we offer all types of vaginoplasties, including peritoneal flaps, penile inversions, sigmoids, as well as minimal depth vaginoplasties, uh, as well as orchiectomies. So what is bottom surgery? Uh, in trans men, bottom surgery is creating a new phallus uh, with either an enlarged clitoris or with tissue from some other part of the body. Are these types of surgeries covered by insurance? In New York State, uh, the state mandates coverage of these surgeries uh, by uh, providers and by insurance companies. So uh, these are covered by insurance. So what are bottom surgery options for trans men? You know, broadly speaking, there's two types of surgeries that can be done. The first is uh, some form of a metoidoplasty, which is using the hormonally enlarged clitoris to create a new phallus and constructing a new urethra so patients can pee standing up. The second type of surgery is a phalloplasty. Uh, and with a phalloplasty, we use tissue from some other part of the body or some adjacent tissue to create a new phallus. So what are the different types of phalloplasties? You know, broad, there's a million different types of phalloplasties and everyone's got their own little version of it, but broadly speaking, there's four types of phalloplasties that are commonly performed. The most common one that's done around the world is probably the RFF, which is uh, the radial forearm free flap. And with that surgery, we use tissue from the forearm to construct uh, a new uh, phallus. The second type of phalloplasty is the anterior lateral thigh flap. Uh, and with that, we use tissue from the front part of your uh, leg, essentially the thigh, uh, to construct a new phallus. The, the third type, and the one that I like a lot, is the abdominal phalloplasty. And with that, we use tissue from the uh, front part of your uh, uh, belly, essentially from the abdomen, to construct a new part, a new phallus. Uh, and finally, uh, the fourth type of phalloplasty that's commonly performed is the latissimus dorsi flap. Uh, and with that, we use tissue from the side of your chest. Uh, and bring it down uh, uh, to create a new phallus. So what is a metoidoplasty? Uh, there's different kinds of metoidoplasty, uh, but generally speaking, a metoidoplasty is using the hormonally enlarged clitoris uh, to construct a new phallus. Uh, typically, the metoidoplasty includes urethral lengthening, so patients can pee standing up, um, as well as constructing the phallus in a way that you know, protrudes outside of the, the body. So uh, prior to bottom surgery, you really don't need to do any other types of procedures, but uh, there are some general requirements that the World Professional Association of Transgender Healthcare Providers um, recommends, including uh, having hormones for a certain length of time beforehand and making sure that you're cleared uh, with respect uh, you know, to getting psychological letters of support prior to surgery. Uh, I find that if patients have been on hormones for at least two years, they have the optimal outcome uh, with a metoidoplasty, and their clitoris expands the most, and they get you know, the most protrusion outside of the body. So you know, one question that comes up often mm -hmm. is, can I uh, keep my vagina for uh, penetrative intercourse after a metoidoplasty or with a phalloplasty? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, although it's a little bit of a controversial answer. Uh, the downside of keeping the vagina is there's a much higher risk of developing a fistula from the urethra, uh, which is a hole that connects the urethra to the outside world in a place that it shouldn't be. Uh, so if you're willing to accept that risk, then the answer is yes, and we'll often do vaginal sparing metoidoplasties for patients. For phalloplasties, if you're advancing the urethra, then that fistula risk is there, but if you do an abdominal phalloplasty, for example, and don't want urethral advancement, then there's no problem with keeping the vagina there. So what is a vaginectomy? Uh, a vaginectomy is removal uh, or cauterization of the vaginal wall and then closing the space where the vagina once was. So there's different ways you can do this vaginal uh, vaginectomy, obviously. Uh, and what we typically do is remove the lining of the vagina and then we'll just close the vaginal wall. We'll do this with our uh, OBGYN colleagues uh, who will assist us during the metoidoplasty. So is a hysterectomy necessary prior to bottom surgery? Uh, it's definitely necessary if you're getting a vaginectomy, um, but if you're not getting a vaginectomy and you're uh, saving the vagina, then uh, you don't have to do the hysterectomy. So what is a metoidoplasty and what are the different kinds of metoidoplasty? Uh, a metoidoplasty is using uh, the hormonally enlarged clitoris to create a new penis. 
Uh, now, that sounds pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of different types of metoidoplasties and things to think about. The first question is whether you get uh, urethral lengthening done with a metoidoplasty. So for a lot of patients, uh, standing to urinate is not that important, and they just want the metoidoplasty without any kind of urethral lengthening. Uh, the second question is whether you get a stroidoplasty done at the same time or not as a metoidoplasty. Uh, and then the third question is whether you would have a vaginectomy done at the same time or not. I would say the majority of our patients choose to have uh, urethral lengthening done with a stroidoplasty and a vaginectomy and a full release of uh, the metoidoplasty to get maximal length. What are some of the risks of metoidoplasty? Now, uh, it depends a little bit on uh, what kind of metoidoplasty you get done. So the things that we worry about are uh, a stricture or a fistula forming in uh, men who get urethral lengthening done. So when we create the new urethra, if the blood supply is compromised or if an infection happened or some issue happens, then uh, that urethra can open up and cause a fistula uh, or a stricture uh, forming, which is scar tissue that plugs up the urinary channel and makes it difficult to urinate. Other things that we worry about is bleeding. Typically that can occur from the side of the vagina and losing some sensation uh, to, the, uh, sen uh, to the head of the penis. And that's if, we're, uh, if a surgeon is too aggressive uh, with uh, dissecting out the penis. Fortunately, that's a very rare uh, occurrence, and most patients are able to still have orgasms and sensation at the tip of the penis. So how long does a metoidoplasty take? Uh, and a lot of that depends on what you have done at the time of a metoidoplasty. So some patients will go and have everything done at one stage, and that includes a hysterectomy, a vaginectomy, urethral lengthening, uh, release, uh, as well as uh, stroidoplasty and implants placed, uh, and uh, the urethral lengthening. Typically, you know, the hysterectomy and vaginectomy can take a few hours, and then the metoidoplasty with urethral lengthening can be another few hours, so that could be five, six hour surgery. Uh, if you're just getting uh, the metoidoplasty done, let's say without a urethral lengthening or without the vaginectomy or without the hysterectomy, uh, that's a pretty quick surgery and can take only about an hour or so. So it's uh, depending on sort of what you get done, it could be anywhere from one hour to up to six hours. So how long will your phallus be uh, after metoidoplasty? Uh, that's a tricky question because it depends so much on what your anatomy is like, you know, how long you've been on hormones, what the MONS looks like, whether you have a full release or not uh, done at the time of a metoidoplasty, and whether you get full urethral extension or not. Uh, so if you have a lot of uh, subcutaneous tissue or a lot of fatty tissue uh, in the MONS area, then the phallus can often be hidden uh, behind that, and it's actually longer than it looks, but it's just hidden by the, the subcutaneous tissues. Uh, if you've been on hormones for a long time and you have really good uh, growth of the clitoris prior to the metoidoplasty, uh, and you don't have a lot of fatty tissue in that Mons area, then you can uh, get up to two inches, sometimes even more, uh, up to three inches on the phallus, uh, depending on what the original appearance of the phallus is. One of the questions that comes up is how do you maximize length uh, with a metoidoplasty? Because we all want as long a penis as you can get. Uh, and there are a few things to do. Uh, the first thing is the longer you've been on hormones, uh, the better uh, the clitoris will be. Typically, maximum uh, uh, length occurs or at maximum growth occurs after at least two to three years of hormonal therapy. Uh, the second thing is uh, if you have a, a lot of fatty tissue uh, above uh, the phallus uh, is to lose some of that fatty tissue so the phallus projects out more. Uh, there is some data that even local application of DHT, which is a testosterone cream to the tip of the phallus, uh, may help improve uh, the size of the phallus. Unfortunately, in America at least, DHT cream is not available, um, but you know, we have had patients get it from elsewhere and use it. And then finally, uh, pumping, uh, which is applying some kind of vacuum device to the penis, both before surgery as well as after surgery, can really help uh, improve the length and the projection forward uh, of uh, the phallus. So will you be able to stand to pee with a metoidoplasty? And this is really an important question. I think this is what uh, most trans men who have genital surgery uh, done uh, want as one of their high priorities? Uh, and the answer is yes, but you have to have urethral lengthening done. So remember, there's different kinds of metoidoplasties, uh, and it's very important if, you, if it's important to you to talk to your surgeon about doing the urethral lengthening so that the urethra gets advanced forward to the tip of the penis. Uh, and once you do that, then most trans men are able to urinate standing up.
So will you be able to have penetrative sex after metoidoplasty? And I have to say, this is a little bit controversial a topic, uh, but I tell most of my patients that the answer is probably no. Uh, now, I, I say that with a little bit of hesitation because I've had a number of patients tell me that they're still able to penetrate, that they get engorgement when they're aroused of the neophallus uh, of the penis uh, uh, after metoidoplasty. And it's enough engorgement uh, that they're able to have sex. The other reason I hesitate just a little bit is that uh, there has been some reports of an implant that goes in for a metoidoplasty. Uh, these are essentially experimental treatments, and in my mind, uh, the, we just don't have good enough data yet to, uh, for me to recommend it. And these implants are not available in the United States. So what kind of recovery can you expect after metoidoplasty? And so much of that depends on what kind of metoidoplasty you get done. So if you get a simple metoidoplasty that doesn't involve release or urethral lengthening or vaginectomy, then you may even be able to go home the same day uh, as surgery. Uh, but if you get a hysterectomy, a vaginectomy, if you get urethral lengthening, implants put in, release, uh, then you uh, typically should be in the hospital for about two days, maybe three days um, at most. Uh, but it will take time to recover, uh, and you may not uh, be able to do any kind of exercise for six to eight weeks after these surgeries. Uh, but you'll be up and walking around and should be able to work at a computer, for example, uh, within a few weeks after surgery. So how much time do you need to take off of work after metoidoplasty? Uh, the first question I always ask patients is, do you want to go to work or not? And so uh, you know, it depends on the kind of work you have and uh, how demanding your boss is and whether... Uh, now, I always want patients to feel fully recovered uh, before they go back to work. Uh, and that process could take, you know, four weeks uh, or maybe even more. Uh, technically, you could probably work, again, depending on the work you have done before that. But I just feel like in our society, we just need some time to sort of re re recover you know, appropriately. We're always getting pushed in directions. And it's time to take, it's important to take time for yourself after these surgeries uh, to really feel fully recovered. So can you get uh, scrotal implants at the time of a metoidoplasty? And the answer is almost yes. Uh, you have to generally have a vaginectomy also done because we use some of that tissue for the implants uh, to create a scrotum, and that's what the implants go into. Uh, and the size of the implants depends on the size of the scrotum uh, that you have uh, when we create it. So are there any risks to getting scrotal implants? And what are some of the issues that come up with these? I think a really common issue that can occur is that the implants can often migrate uh, upward. Um, and that occurs for a variety of reasons. But part of it is that the scrotoplasty it's, uh, often projects a little bit more inward. And when patients walk, that implant can uh, move up and down, and a capsule forms around that implant. Uh, this is unfortunately a pretty common issue uh, and might require revision surgeries for patients uh, in whom that happens. Other risks include an infection of the implant uh, or even an erosion of the implant that can occur. Uh, one of the things I tell patients after a scrotoplasty and implant placement is to walk a little bit with their legs spread apart for the first uh, at least few weeks uh, or even up to a month after the surgery. And that tries to keep that implant down and prevents that kind of migration that can occur. But even in patients who follow the rules, uh, unfortunately this uh, uh, complication can occur. Uh, fortunately, it's a fairly easy fix and uh, uh, requires a minor surgery to get it fixed. So what are the complications and advantages of the abdominal phalloplasty? Now, with the abdominal phalloplasty, uh, the downside of the surgery is that no urethra is created at the time of the abdominal phalloplasty. So you've got to do that at a later stage, and when you do it at a later stage, it may not come all the way up to the tip of the penis, uh, but it still usually is enough that you can stand to pee. The second downside of the abdominal phalloplasty is if patients lose a lot of weight and become much thinner later on, that might affect the size of the penis. Uh, that's something that no one's ever written a paper about, but we've also noticed it in clinical experience. So someone comes in, uh, has a perfect looking phallus, and then you know, they lose 30, 40 pounds, and then their phallus may get smaller as a result of it. What I do like about the abdominal phalloplasty, though, is that you leave much less scar tissue than any of the other options. Uh, and I think it's much less disfiguring in terms of the donor site where that tissue is taken from. So how long does the phalloplasty take? Uh, these surgeries can be fairly complicated. Uh, the uh, RFF, the forearm phalloplasty, can take six to eight hours. The uh, MLD phalloplasty also can take about six hours or so to do. Uh, and the abdominal phalloplasty is the shortest, easiest surgery in some ways, technically 
typically takes uh, me about two hours to do. Uh, the ALT phalloplasty also can take about six, six hours or so. So are there multiple surgeries for all of these phalloplasties? Uh, for the RFF, typically it's one surgery. Uh, I don't perform RFF phalloplasties myself, but sometimes patients will have uh, a glansplasty done at a later time. Sometimes a glansplasty will be done at the same time. For the abdominal phalloplasty, oftentimes you need to have a second surgery to advance the urethra, or you have to have a met metoidoplasty initially prior to the abdominal phalloplasty so you're able to stand and urinate. And the same is the case with the MLD phalloplasty as well, where you'll have a metoidoplasty to advance the urethra uh, and then have the MLD, and then maybe another surgery to advance the urethra even uh, more forward. How long will your phallus be after phalloplasty? And it depends a lot on what you want and you know, what your tissue allows for. Typically, we aim for anywhere from four to eight inches, um, uh, eight inches being really on the long side, but uh, something in, you know, in that range for the phalloplasty. Uh, and generally, we get about five or six inches of uh, length, depending on how you measure the phallus. Can you choose a length for your phalloplasty? Uh, that's a really good question, and it depends a lot on the uh, tissue that you have available. Uh, no, the downside is the longer the uh, phallus you have, Oftentimes the blood supply can be more compromised at the tip of the phallus and the sensation can be more compromised. So it increases your risk of surgery. Uh, and so you, know, you want I think, what I think is an appropriately sized phallus that uh, looks good on your body, that fits what you want as well. So can you choose your donor site? Uh, the answer is yes, with some contingencies. So it depends a little bit on what kind of phalloplasty you're having. So obviously, if you're having an RFF, you might be able to choose which arm you get done, but that depends a little bit on you know, the presence of tattoos, what arm you write with, what the blood supply is to the arms. So it depends a little bit on your physiological factors. Uh, the same thing applies to the MLD. It depends on the, sort of the quality of the uh, muscle and whether the overlying tissue is soft and flexible enough to be able to harvest. And for the abdominal phalloplasty, it really just depends on the, the tissue that's there and on uh, how long the tissue is or what kind of tissue is there that allows us to create the phallus. Um, and the same applies for the ALT as well. So, I mean, ultimately, where you choose your donor site is really what kind of phalloplasty you're getting done. Um, you know, so uh, prior to surgery, some of these phalloplasties might require hair removal. Uh, generally, uh, I recommend having the hair removal done for the abdominal phalloplasty or the RFF. Generally, for the latissimus dorsi, there isn't that much hair in that part of patients' bodies, but if there is, uh, it can also be removed. Uh, the other option, of course, is to do the hair removal after surgery, uh, which is one of the nice things. So you have these options that are open to you uh, if you uh, do, Feel like new hair is growing back, there's no downside of having the hair removal done uh, once the phalloplasty is complete. So uh, should you consider a monsplasty and you know, what is a monsplasty? Uh, a monsplasty is removal of the fatty tissue uh, in the suprapubic area where the pubic bone is just above uh, the phallus. Uh, and you might consider a monsplasty in a few situations. One is if you don't have a very large uh, uh, neoclitoris or neophallus present for metoidoplasty, uh, then the monsplasty can help the phallus stick out a little bit more because you remove that fat that's burying the, uh, the phallus. Uh, and you might also consider uh, not doing a monsplasty if you're thinking about uh, an abdominal phalloplasty because that's the tissue that'll be used for the abdominal phalloplasty. So, if you think there's any chance after metoidoplasty of having uh, an abdominal phalloplasty, then I would not do a monsplasty. So the question is, will I be able to stand and pee after a phalloplasty? Uh, and it really depends on what you want. So after RFF and ALT, you'll be able to stand and pee, assuming there's no urethral issues that come up. After the abdominal phalloplasty or the uh, latissimus dorsi phalloplasty, uh, you won't be able to stand to pee unless you've already planned for it and done something like a metoidoplasty to advance the urethra forward. Typically, uh, we can advance the urethra forward though at later stages and permit you to urinate if you haven't had it done. What I generally do is first do the metoidoplasty, advance the urethra forward, and then we do the phalloplasty, uh, and it, we can advance the urethra forward even more after that uh, to permit you to stand to pee. So will you be able to have penetrative sex after a phalloplasty? A few patients of mine have reported that they were able to penetrate with their phalloplasty, 
But in general, you'll need to have a penile prosthesis placed uh, in order to get the rigidity for penetrative sex. So what is a penile prosthesis? A penile prosthesis is an implant that goes into the penis that allows you to have penetrative sex and makes the penis hard. Now, I have some samples here to talk about the different kinds of implants that you have as an option. The first option is a malleable implant. And with this option, the implant is always sort of hard. Uh, and so when you want to have sex, you bend it up to give you uh, the right angle for your penis. And whenever you're done, you can bend it back down uh, to make the erection sort of go away. The uh, problem with this is it's always kind of hard, and it's never really, really hard. And so you always have this thing inside your body. And there's some argument that this increases the risk of an erosion, uh, which means that the implant can come out of the skin because it's always kind of hard and pushing against the skin. The second type of implant, and I have a model here, is uh, a malleable, or is a three-piece penile implant. And with this, there's actually a pump that you push on that goes inside the scrotum. And when you push on this pump, fluid gets transferred from the reservoir into the cylinders that are located inside your penis. So these cylinders get hard as you push on the pump. Whenever you're done, that is whenever you're done with sex, you push on another button and the fluid gets transferred back from these cylinders uh, into the reservoir. So we have a model of how that looks. So inside uh, the penis uh, are the cylinders and the pump itself is located inside the scrotum. So whenever you push on the pump, You'll see, you have to push on it a few times, but you'll see that the penis gets uh, harder and becomes much more rigid and becomes upright. Uh, and the more you push, the harder the penis gets. So this is transferred fluid from that reservoir into the penis. And then whenever you're done, you push on the button again, and the erection will just go away again. So the three-piece penile prosthesis mimics a natural erection, but it does have more components, and there is a risk of an infection or an erosion occurring of the prosthesis. So what kind of recovery can you expect after a phalloplasty? Uh, typically, it depends a lot on what kind of phalloplasty you're going to get done. So the abdominal phalloplasty, in my opinion, is probably the fastest recovery because uh, it's just using tissue from your abdomen. Uh, we typically patient, keep patients in the hospital just for two or three days, uh, and then after that, patients can start moving around. Now, you won't be able to do exercise or kind of vigorous activity at least for you know, six weeks or so or maybe even longer depending on how things look, uh, but you can get up and move around pretty quickly. Uh, the other types of surgeries, including the RFF, the MLD, and the ALT, generally are much longer recoveries because the surgery is longer and it's much more delicate in terms of putting the blood vessels and the nerves back together. Uh, typically, uh, patients are in the hospital for you know, four or five nights and uh, they may not be able to do any kind of exercise, uh, at least for a few months. So will you need to take off work to heal after these surgeries? And the answer is yes. Uh, you'll typically uh, want to take off at least a month or so to give yourself a chance to heal. But it also depends on the kind of phalloplasty you're getting done. So if it's a really complicated phalloplasty like the RFF, then you might need a little bit more time to heal, both from your arm where the donor site is taken, as well as from the penis, just to make sure there's no uh, complications. But you know, when patients ask me this question, I always tell them that in America, especially, there's this rush to get back to work and to you know, back, get back to uh, everything, all these demands that are made on you. This is a big surgery, and I think it's really important to recover from these big surgeries and to give your child self a chance to really heal uh, and give yourself some time for yourself uh, after these surgeries. Can you get scrotal implants? Uh, and the answer is yes in almost all cases. It just depends on whether you have a scrotoplasty done or not. So you need a space to put those implants. And the size of the implants depends a lot on how much space is there uh, that's created with the uh, scrotoplasty. And also what your anatomy is like. Uh, you know, if you don't have a really big penis, then you know, having really large implants probably won't be the best. So it's a combination of what kind of sort of class you have and as well as like cosmetic features and you know, what looks right. So what is a glans plasty? You know, when we uh, create a, a new phallus uh, with almost any of these types of phalloplasties I've been talking about, the tip of the penis uh, generally is not created and it just looks like a tube. So we'll often create a glans plasty either at the same time as a primary phalloplasty or we'll do it at a later stage procedure. And that's just to give you the head of the 
penis and to make it look much more natural. Typically with a glansplasty, uh, it does require a skin graft uh, that goes around the head of the penis. Uh, I'll take that skin graft from a site that a patient has already had prior scar tissue so that it's not disfiguring. Uh, and we'll wrap it around and you know, make it look like uh, the head of the penis to make it look much more natural.